For those of you just coming in, our next talk will be given by Professor David Zilberman, University of California, Berkeley. And the title is The Cost of Delays in Biotech Regulatory Approvals. Okay. 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 Okay, so okay. I'm sorry for all this. Okay, so uh, as the slide said, for many years I was admiring a professor in Berkeley, his name is Vince Resch, and he uh, was involved with uh, a bunch of people that uh, found a cure for uh, river blindness and saved about uh, $200,000, uh, 200,000 people a year. At the same time, there was another person, his name is Ingo Putraikas, that came with the idea of uh, golden rice. Every year, uh, about 500,000 uh, children uh, die from blindness uh, all, uh, worldwide. He came with the idea to introduce uh, vitamin E in rice, golden rice. And this technology now was available uh, in, a, in a way that would be effective since 2002. But for whatever reason, it, was, uh, it wasn't uh, introduced uh, commercially. Now, generally what happened, we have a regulatory approach, and the regulator has three options, to approve a technology, to disallow a technology, or to delay the decision. So the decision makers have decided uh, now for about uh, 13 years to delay the decision. As economists, we try to assess, good, what is the economic or social cost of this delay? And under the most conservative assumption, uh, we figure out that uh, the cost of the delay monetarily is more than $2 billion, but more importantly, it's about 1 million eyesight were lost because of this delay. Now, what is the justification to the delay? You delay justification if you will get more knowledge or you will know something better. Do, you know, do we know anything now that we didn't know before? Do we have less awareness about risks to discover new risks that we don't have before? So basically we had a delay of introduction of a genetically modified a GM technology that cost at least a million eyesight, I think uh, probably the number is much bigger because of some uh, unspecified delay that uh, is justified by certain groups that oppose GMO. This is one example, but this is not the only example. There is a, a, a new a variety of uh, GM uh, varieties that can uh, deal with a ma a maize streak virus, which uh, or, or, uh, cause 30% uh, loss and yield uh, in Africa. There is uh, another variety that uh, can deal with uh, another variety or uh, another trait of corn that uh, have similar, similar effect in other parts of Africa. There is a transgenic uh, platin banana and banana that is suffering from a virus uh, in uh, Uganda. The trait is there, it can be used, but the there are regulations not to use it. So to some extent we have a large array of traits that are available for commercialization, have been available for commercialization for a long time and they haven't been used. Why? What is the justification? To some extent the poor is now paying the price for the anxieties of the middle class. So what is GMO? Uh, almost everything that we eat is genetically modified. Now, GMO are uh, using the, apply the best technique in molecular biology in order to understand what we are doing uh, as we modified varieties. Instead of using radioactivity or random experimentation, we now use a gene structure. A lot of people say that GMO belongs to Monsanto. It's not owned by Monsanto. Actually, a lot of the early discoveries were in Berkeley. A lot of the licenses belong to university. Patents are expired. It's not a technology that belongs to a company. It belongs to humanity. And uh, Apple owns also a lot of patents. 
You see, the fact that the company own the technology doesn't mean the technology is bad. Now, how dangerous is the GM? There are many organizations uh, that support it. Almost all the National Academy of Science of almost any possible organization uh, support it. Now, actually, I made this presentation in Berkeley and someone said, but they didn't do it recently. So the point is that, there, that almost any organization that you can think about basically said that it at least the safe as traditional technology. Now, E.O. Wilson, there is a big rift between uh, molecular biologies and organization, or, organismal biologies, and E.O. Wilson is the greatest organismal biology, and he said that uh, GM is kosher. Uh, not a long time ago, I uh, brought to Berkeley a Jared Diamond. You know Jared Diamond, the guy with the guns and steel, etc. He gave a talk, and uh, and people loved it. Then they asked him, what do you think about GMO? Actually, one of my students asked him, and he said, oh, it's okay with me. And I remember that some of the activists said it was a great talk, except of the nonsense about GMO. So, to some extent, if you really look at within the scientific community, there is a lot of uh, consensus that it's, uh, that it's basically doing well. And uh, even the European Commission made some uh, admit that after all these years, there is something good about it. Despite of it, despite that it provides a new option to produce food and increase yield and deal with a lot of troubles, it has limited use. Basically, we use it in several crop, corn, soybean, uh, cotton, papaya. And even though we produce it on, in a few crops, a lot of our meat globally is uh, produced with GMO. Now, one of the things that is happening at a lot of time when I make presentation, people say, but these are not food of the poor. The point is this. People today eat chicken. If you go to Africa, you, you have chicken. And what I know is chicken is processed corn and processed soybean. So to some extent, the fact that people eat, uh, 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 eat uh, protein, uh, protein around the world is because of GM. Now, a lot of people say to Berkeley that, uh, gosh, it's really terrible to eat meat because a pound of meat requires four times as much grain as a pound of bread. But I know that a lot of my best friends, the, the good activists, like a good steak and pay a lot for it. So to some extent, GM already contributes to, to solve a lot of uh, food problems. Now, generally speaking, there are uh, three generations of GM trades, the first generation that are uh, what I call damage control uh, trades that reduce pest damage. And generally what they do is that increase yield because yield is potential output times one minus damage and they reduce the damage. The second generation that improve product quality and the third generation that are pharmaceutical, etc. So if you look at what we have, we have a paper in the annual review of, uh, annual review of uh, environmental resources and we have a list of all the trades. There are about 250 to 300 trades that are there and uh, in pre-trial, 50% are basically uh, second generation, and there are a lot of third generation. Actually, the new uh, promising medicine uh, to Ebola is the GE. It's a genetic modified uh, 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 variety. So to some extent, uh, you have a large number of uh, traits that are there. Now, the problem is that Almost all over the world, you cannot introduce a genetic modified organism. So to some extent, you have these 300 traits that are, uh, that are on the shelf. And some of these traits are, 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 very, are, very, are very efficient and very useful. For example, there is a very good trait that allows you to, have, to produce soybean that is uh, much more efficient in terms of digestibility. Today, when you look at soybean, a lot of it is not digestible by the cow. So high volume of soybean done provide as much as nutritional value and also generate a lot of uh, pollution. And you can uh, 
basically gets much more, out, much more productivity out of soybean. It's available. You can increase shelf life. You can increase nutritional content, like golden rice. So to some extent, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of varieties that are not being uh, introduced. Why? If I was an, invest, uh, an investor and I have to ask myself, do I invest in a technology that has a certain uh, regulatory future? No. Instead, I invest in another Twitter. The world is full of companies like Twitter, and, too little, and there is not enough companies that are doing life science, in my view. So if you look at first generation, generally, they tend to increase uh, yield. Now, but, uh, uh, to increase it because reduce damage, generally the impact vary by location. If you have a lot of pest damage, the yield will be, uh, the yield effect will be much bigger. So in many cases, not only that it will increase yield, it also will allow to increase production to, uh, to other locations. Moreover, when you have less pest damage, then suddenly it's worthwhile to invest in pesticides. So suddenly the, there is a multiplicative effect. If you look at Africa, generally you have a lot of pests, so why would, invest in a, why, why would you use fertilizer? So you have less pest damage, you have more fertilizer, yield effect is going up. So if you try to explain how come that in, uh, let's say, Ghana you have uh, one, t one and a half ton per hectare, in the US we have 10 ton, be better varieties, Less uh, in the US, better variety, less pest damage, more fertilizer. That's basically it. These things are complementary. Now, so the key point in economic is the intensive versus extensive margin. Intensive margin is that when you adopt, you adopt at a certain location, you replace one variety versus the other. And the extensive margin is that you basically extend the region where a crop is grown. So if you look at it, so if you look at uh, this is pest damage, in this area you don't switch varieties, here you switch to GM, and this is new area. Now, why it's important? Because we did some empirical analysis that we tried to understand what is the pattern of adoption of uh, GMO. So if you look at uh, cotton, so you have uh, three colors. Uh, you have the, 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 the red, which is extensive mildly new area, blue switching and uh, pink which is the old variety so you have about 60 percent adoption and about 15 percent new varieties uh, in china most of the about third of the uh, of the land is new variety in india you see that the acreage of cotton in, in india went up india basically double or even more uh, its cotton area it become now the number two or number one producer of cotton Basically, what happened is that the U.S. lost cotton production and India increased cotton production. It was a huge boon to the farmers in India. Yield uh, uh, profit per acre for farmers at least went up by uh, 25%. The cotton industry is, there is doing very well. And most of the farmers there are smallholders. So you cannot tell me it's only for big corporations. In India, they are mostly smallholders. And you can see that you have this uh, success story. Now, if you look at soybean, that is the most interesting thing. In the U.S., most 90% most of the soybean is, uh, round, uh, is round up ready. Most of it is basically switching. In Brazil, you can see increase in soybean. And some of the land is, uh, is, is new land. And Argentina, that's the thing that is amazing. 100% adoption of GM. And a lot of this adoption is basically is an extensive margin. Then you can say, what happened? Did they destroy the pampas? Maybe. But the reality is that most of the impact was that people start double cropping. They grow soybean and wheat. So the, the agricultural uh, footprint didn't increase very much, but on the other hand, productivity increased. So to some extent, the fact that people adopted the uh, increased adoption of uh, soybean is to a large extent because of GM. In most cases, they adopted it with uh, no tillage. So the environmental benefits have been quite uh, substantial. Now, when it comes to maize, you can see most of the maize in the world is without GM. The U.S. is using, producing uh, having about 25% of the acreage and about 60% uh, of the output. And uh, in the U.S., the impact uh, was quite substantial. Now, we did some uh, econometrics. 
you know, I always use it because every time that I don't have any numerical thing, some activist said, do you have any referee uh, research? Yes. But the net effect is that you can see that if you look at the uh, three crops, corn, soybean, and uh, cotton, in corn the yield increase, the supply increases between 5 to 12 percent, in cotton between 5 or 20 percent, and in soybean about between 2 to 40. In soybean it's about 30 percent, in cotton about 12 to 15, and in corn about 8. Now you say, oh, it's not a big deal. We have 8 percent reduction in corn in 2008, and we have a huge food prices. Food crisis. The situation that the demand elasticity for this crop are relatively low. So if you have 10% less supply, you are in trouble. Without GM in soybean and corn, food prices would be sky high. Now, for us in the middle class people, it doesn't matter. We can even afford buying organic. But people in uh, Haiti and other countries, a lot of time don't have food. Generally, we have a trickle down approach. We eat first, then China. The last is 80 in some part of India and Africa. So when you have 10% uh, increase in food, it means that some people at the bottom have what to uh, add some to it. Now, if you look at the impact on uh, prices, you can see that the impact on uh, the, the price is, is much lower than it, uh, it, uh, it would have been otherwise. The price of corn is lower by about 10%. The price of uh, the price of cotton by about 20, 25, and the price of soybean is even more, 30 percent. So this reduction in the price are very, very substantial. Because a lot of people said GM didn't make a difference. Reducing prices is a big difference. The having, allowing poor people to buy stuff, in my view, is a big difference. Now, the other thing is that uh, a lot of people say GM is sophisticated. We cannot give it to African farmer. It's too complex. If you look at it, every place that you introduced this technology the, and it was available, there was incredible rate of adoption. There is a story uh, from South Africa that I, that I love uh, to tell. There is a radio talk, there is a, some of these calling uh, shows, and uh, there was a, some, a black farmer called, and uh, the host asked him, why do we adopt uh, GM? And uh, they said, I adopted because it increased my yield by 34%. Then a white farmer uh, calls and he asks him, why you don't adopt the He said, I don't adopt it because it's immoral. So I think that really was the situation in many parts in the world. Now, altogether, if you look at the impact, and there was a National Research Council report, I was part of it, that you can see that a lot of people in the U.S. In uh, adopted because it increased water, worker safety. It allows them uh, flexibility in farm management, reduced it also reduced effort. Now, a lot of people say, God, we really would like farmer to get up in the morning and exercise IPM, which in principle, I love IPM if you do it. I like to stay in bed in the morning. And I think the same true is a lot of, with a lot of farmers. So to some extent, I don't see anything bad by the fact that it may uh, uh, reduce uh, increased convenience. Now, who benefits from it? So generally speaking, a lot of people assume that it's a big company, but these are old studies, and generally the old studies, the price, uh, the price effect is not quite substantial. But even in the initial study, you can see that in some, that the that, uh, consumer benefit quite a lot, 33%. If you do studies now, the benefit for consumer are immense. I'll give you one example. Cotton is the only product that adopted, the GM is adopted globally. The price of cotton didn't change in the last 15 or 20 years. It may not be good for farmer, but for sure it's great to consumer. If we would have high rate of adoption of corn, the price of corn would be higher. And I would venture to say that if we will have adoption of corn throughout the world, price of corn will be about $4 a bushel. Maybe people in Illinois don't, don't like it, they like six. And you would also will have, uh, uh, you will have also enough, uh, uh, if, if, uh, if in corn, I'm sorry, the price of corn will be uh, for, uh, $4 a bushel, and you probably will enough corn to increase biofuel production by about 5 or 10%. But to some extent, the benefits are distributed between farmer, producers, and the company. Now, this is the example of the double seed. Now, there are, uh, the, uh, 
obviously this is not a technology for, uh, uh, for big farmers. In South Africa, farmers use it uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, white corn. In uh, India, small farmers go it uh, for cotton. In Philippine, people use it. Uh, in some countries, it's not available to the poor because of uh, credit, credit or supply availability. But over time, it's available for uh, everyone. So to some extent, I think this is a technology that is really scale neutral. Now, as I said before, there is a greenhouse uh, gas uh, saving because of no tillage and because you save land. You save land, you save gasoline. If you increase yield, it's good for the environment, They're generally, because you basically ne ne need less yield. You have, if you don't have enough food, you have deforestation. So we try to calculate what is the greenhouse gas effect of GM, and without extensive margin effect, it's uh, already, it's about, about uh, like 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions of cars. And if you will have a much higher uh, level of adoption, it will be, the impact will be much bigger. Now, generally speaking, when you look at uh, the environment and try to look at the technology, the approach now is, gosh, we have to worry, we have to make sure that there is no risk that is introduced. As an economist, you have to look at what is the alternative risk. What happens if you continue with the status quo? If you worry about greenhouse gases and you have a technology that reduces greenhouse gases and reduces our agricultural footprint, it may have some risk, but it also reduces a lot of risk. So, obviously, it's not uh, perfect, there are resistance, there are a lot of problems, but we can deal with it, and in most cases, it's reversible. You know, it's, a, it's not a highway or a dam. Now, generally, what main problem of BM are the bans. You cannot have, a, people say, gosh, let's make the, the, sure that the technology is safe. You cannot make sure that the technology is safe in a lab. You have to do it in the field. I was a programmer. Till you write a program and have two bugs, it, do, you, it doesn't work. There is now Apple's uh, iPhone 6. Apple is a great company. I probably will buy it after the first uh, round of bugs will disappear. So you cannot have a new technology without testing in the field. So to some extent, uh, the ban wouldn't really let la the technology. Now I have this huge list of all the trades that are available for the study we have in nature biotech. And you can really see that it can change a, a lot of agriculture. It can change a lot as fruits and vegetables and a lot of crops that are used by the poor, but today the regulatory environment is such that no one will invest in it. Now, this is a study, what we really looked at the history of uh, GM, it was really soaring like any other technology, but since 1999, uh, it's more or less a stagnant. Why? Because of regulation. So, what are the cost of the regulation? It takes now 10 to 15 years to bring a new product. It costs $160 million to introduce a new product. No one wants to invest in it. So the net effect is that we really have a lot of options that we are lose. We are, when we have less, less productive agricultural system, you have more land in production and you, base, and you have more pollution. Now, if we would uh, FGM, the price of uh, wheat and uh, other prod product uh, would have been going down, more land will be available for other activities. For example, in India, you can really save about 20 or 30 percent of the land that is in rice and wheat if you, have, if you start introducing uh, some of the potential. And then you have land that you can use it for other crops uh, that, uh, can, uh, that you can utilize resources uh, better. We would reduce the use of pesticide. So basically, we would move to more renewable agriculture. If people speak about a renewable world and they don't think about agriculture as key for renewability, I don't know what will be the base for renewability. Yesterday, we had this really interesting talk about uh, how we run out of fuel. If we run out of fuel, we can basically go back to the Stone Age. There are a lot of stone left. Or we can use agriculture, and you can use agriculture, and uh, actually we can move to a system that rely on this type of technology, and we will be all better off. Now, so, so to some extent, 
without uh, with, with limited basically what the regulation of GM is that you basically now you need the license from uh, some environmental group to use new biological knowledge and I don't see that with this you'll be able to protect bi biodiversity in rural or agricultural based industry to some extent Basically, having a war against molecular technologies, because the moment that you don't allow GM, you won't have biofuel, you won't have a lot of other solutions. The, 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 the net effect is you, our ability to uh, mitigate uh, and reduce uh, and deal with greenhouse gases is, is limited. Now, I know that uh, according to Paul Ehrlich and other people, we have about five million, uh, five billion too many people in this world. But I don't know how you can make the criteria who doesn't belong here. So to some extent, a technology that allow you to keep uh, more people is quite useful. Now, so if, uh, if, if I summarize, if even under constraint, already GM increased yield, reduced commodity prices, and improved environmental uh, health. But the restrictive, the restriction really reduces the ability to develop this technology. The potential hasn't been used. In my view, the field of molecular and cell biology has been really, has been really killed, especially in Europe. I was in Germany in a summit. Germany is quite good in this area. A lot of departments really disappeared. What you have here is really, is fantastic. But uh, in Germany, a lot of people that were working on molecular in agriculture, <laughs> And uh, the ability to develop the bioeconomy is uh, declined. Now, we really should be empowered by knowledge, not constrain it. Now, I'm, I'm not against eco-agriculture or a lot of other solutions as long as you take advantage and integrate GM. I, I, uh, Pam Ronald is a good friend of mine, and I really believe that you can combine organic and GM. You can combine a lot of approach. People speak about, the, we have in Berkeley something called diversified farming system without GM and any molecular system. To me, we really need to be inclusive when it comes to agriculture, and we look at sustainability, we look at technology, sustainability and sophisticated are not opposite, they go together. And to, and to me, what I really try to do is that when we don't take advantage of the sophisticated technology, we lose a lot and our ability to deal with scarcity problem and climate change is limited. Thanks. Time for a couple of questions. fantastic presentation based on economics and science and sound reason. Suppose I were an individual, a region, our country that wanted my corn not to be GMO corn, or wanted my wheat not to be GMO wheat. Last week, USDA reported uh, genetic transfer traits in the test fields in the Northwest. Nature has published over the last dozen years genetic flow in Mexico. Suppose I were an individual that did, or a region or a country just didn't want that. It seems to me that the gene flow here is a problem that you have to speak to. Okay, no, I, I agree. The point is every technology has some problem, and this is one of the challenges to deal with the gene flow. Now, I, I, think, I, I actually think that developing genetic material that basically doesn't multiply is one solution. If you really worry about gene flow, developing genetic material that doesn't uh, multiply, like uh, the terminator gene, doesn't exist, but that was one, uh, one type of solution. But when everything said and done, uh, it's an important problem, we have to deal with it, you have to worry about it. But when everything said and done, to some extent, it, it may be a price that we have to pay. But as I said before, you can really use a terminator solution and also you can need to develop some sort of financial incentive that will make people 
basically be more careful about it. But this is the important problem, I admit. Thank you. Thank you, David. But in reply to your question, this uh, gene uh, contamination has been around since hybrid corn in the 1940s. We think it's GMOs, it's any hybrid that will do that. So I would say, you know, let's go back to the future on that one. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to add to your, your, your great presentation, I'm a soil scientist, I'm all for GMOs because it's science. And, uh, and I'm, I got no qualms about it. But very few people talk about the anti-GMO people talk about the fact that GMOs are widely utilized in medicine. Big time, big time. GMOs are widely utilized in medicine. And that means that people don't care about what's in their pills or in their injections, but they care about their food. I think the agricultural community should, uh, should publicize more the overwhelming uh, use of GMOs in medicine. I, I guess I was a little bit... 25% of the medicine to me, today are GM medicine. Actually, I always tell the story. My sister passed away a year ago, but her life was extended by two years. She had cancer because of a GM medicine. Now, my feeling is that food is a positive form of medicine. It makes it make you... Move it makes you healthier and better. So I don't see why negative medicine should, you use GMO in negative medicine and you shouldn't use it in positive medicine. It's a great point. Good. Last question and then we can lead our speaker during the break. That was a uh, very unusual presentation coming from a Berkeley scholar. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, many of my friends are deeply concerned about um, about labeling food products um, and feel that, that uh, as a community uh, we have the right to understand the processes that are used to make our food, uh, food quality issues aside. Um, and there has been quite a strong um, backlash from the private sector about uh, lobbying against labeling laws. I'd like to hear your comments about this. this uh, okay. I, I actually worked a lot on the labeling thing. Now, uh, to be honest, when the labeling started, uh, the, now, the reason that uh, I was against labeling is not that I'm against labeling. I think that if you have GM, non GM, and you have, car see, when generally when you eat a, a chocolate bar, at the end you have calories, uh, carbohydrates, etc., etc., you can be GM, non GM. But the way that they wanted to have the labeling, it will be like a cigarette. So you buy a, a chocolate bar, it will be huge, GM, and it may be dangerous to your life. So the question is not so much labeling or not, but what form of labeling? and what will be the strategy of labeling. I don't think that anyone that is reasonable is against labeling per se. You can have it in the back with everything else. But if suddenly the only thing that you the, 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 the say about the product is that it's, that it's GM or not, that, that's a big problem. So I think it's not la labeling, but how you label and what the message that you deliver with the label. Thank you very much. Illinois.